are two Max Torkelsons. Obviously, one's the dad and one's the son. <laughs> I don't know if there's a third, but I know that Max Torkelson, too, isn't a junior. But anyway, um, I didn't know him all that well because I was a senior when he was a sophomore. But we attended the academy together for two years when I was a junior and a senior. And as time would have it, eventually he became the president of the North Pacific Union Conference and served in that capacity until he retired. I don't know how many years that was, but um, recently I listened to uh, Dan Jackson introduce a new program. I don't know how new it is. It was new to me where it's called Turning Point. And each of the Union Conference presidents were given a slot to share an experience or part of their story of what was a turning point in their life. And I wanted to uh, have Max tell his story in his words rather than in my words. So at this time, we will listen to Max and also see him and Connie um, Vanderman Jeffries as she interviews him. about there was a significant turning point in your life very early on. Describe that to us. Uh, my dad was a camp director. He was a youth director and they were uh, building a new camp, Northern Lights Camp in, uh, in North Dakota, almost right on the Canadian border. And pastors were rotating through to help with the building, but they would take a little time to water ski in the evening. And one time they, we were water skiing and it was kind of on the other side of the lake and my dad and I drove the boat back. I hadn't learned to swim How yet. How old were you? I was four. Four, okay. And um, we had life jackets in the boat but I didn't have one on mm. and I was dressed completely with shoes and everything mm. and at some freak way the boat hit a wave and turned over and I remember going down through the water and seeing the bubbles of the air going up and thinking I wasn't going to live and, but I was kicking my hands and feet even though I didn't know how to swim and my dad took me by the uh, scruff of the neck and did what he should never do you Boy. should stay with the boat but he started swimming to the shore with you with me fully clothed squirming around and he trying to swim and he got to the place where he thought he could not swim another stroke so much so that he quit swimming let his legs go down and just and of course he was praying that God would keep him afloat but his toes just felt some mud in the bottom of the lake and that helped him to know that if I just swim a little farther I'll probably be able to stand and so he was able to get us safely. And I, I just remember that night being in bed and all tucked under the covers and my dad came and knelt down by my bed and just prayed and just poured out his heart thanking mm -hmm. God for saving particularly my life and telling me hmm. God has saved you, Max, for a purpose. And, and I don't know what old. that purpose is, but mm -hmm. you need to keep your life in harmony with God's plan for you. And at four years old, and you remember that. Oh, I remember it very well. Wow. <laughs> and that was okay. That's at four. Then something happened to you when you were about 14 years old. You were a preacher's kid, like I mentioned, and... Um, there are more stories, sorry. <laughs> Uh, obviously, I think it's about a half an hour that he uh, tells more experiences, but I wanted you to hear, hear this particular story for yourself from him. Um, what a life-changing experience that was for him. He's remembered it all these years. And I'm sure that his parents, obviously, that they loved him and the rest of his siblings. And uh, I don't know if he was the oldest. I think he was. He has a younger brother named Monty and I think another sister, or a sister. And I suspect, like every family, that there's a scrapbook that they keep. The first step, when did that happen? The first smile, um, all of those firsts that they record. 
with the extraordinary experiences are just stand out so significantly from these expected happenings. When we expect our babies to crawl, we expect our little children to run. Well, I don't think Jesus' mother was any different from any other mother. She must have made mental note, at least, of all the firsts in her son's life, the first smile, the first time he rolled over, the first time he lifted his head, the first time he crawled, the first step. But certainly, there were more important things to record in Jesus' infancy, just like with Max. This is uh, one of the many mountain peaks that uh, are just engraved in his memory. And so there were experiences like that in the life of Jesus. And if she lived in our age, she probably would have had a video camera and capture the audio and video and share that with her son. But she lived in an age of sandals, dusty roads, and burrows as their transportation. So she only treasured these things in her heart. And it's interesting to me that twice that phrase is mentioned. Once after the shepherds came from their extraordinary, uh, unusual experience of having angels break into their reality and sing a song that probably is better than any choir that's ever been put together. And it was then, after the shepherds appeared and told her their story, where it says, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And that, of course, is part of our scripture reading. But it was, it was recorded a second time. But this was when Jesus was 12 and gone to the temple. And uh, they left him behind. And so when they finally made it back to Jerusalem, they found him in the temple. And they chastised him a bit for being so negligent. But he, in a very kind way, it's interesting how Jesus relates to us. He doesn't shake his finger at us and scold us. He just said, knowest thou not that I must be about my father's business. And the next verse says, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Well, good biographies never start with their subject. There is usually a background of seminal events that are highly relevant and rise to the surface to make the child who he, who he or she is. Undoubtedly, the pre-pregnancy and pre-delivery stories were treasured part of her memories that she pondered. And it's interesting, if you look at the text carefully, maybe you didn't notice as you, if you read it, but in one it uses the word pondered. So it's not just the impact of the event, but a reflection on its significance. And I'm sure we're not stretching the truth if we were to insert this idea into all of these stories that we're going to allude to. That in addition to treasuring these two stories, it was the next story and the next story. These things were so significant that she treasured them in her heart and she must have pondered them through the next X number of years until Jesus' ministry began. Well, Elizabeth had that kind of experience when it was time to name their son. Zechariah had been told by the angel Gabriel that his wife would give birth when both of them were dead reproductively, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> and Zechariah was told that their son would be great in the sight of the Lord and that he would be filled with the Spirit from his birth. This should encourage those of us who are more advanced in our spiritual journey. I mean, we're no longer 17, 18, or 19 like Mary may have been. We're, some of us are closer to Elizabeth's age, whatever that age was. Uh, we can all speak for ourselves and identify where we are in our journey. But this should encourage us that we should never conclude that God doesn't have a plan for our life. Don't get scared. I don't think this is any indication that any of us who are dead reproductively are going to have another family. But 
we're still useful in God's hands. And as I was pondering the age issue, it occurred to me that this must have been providentially significant and merciful. Because when John faced the end of his life, I'm pretty sure that his parents had passed away. And they didn't need to hear about or witness how he ended his journey. And of course, that would have been a tremendous heartache for them to have absorbed into their mind and heart. Well, Gabriel went on to tell Zechariah that as a result of John's ministry, many would be brought back to the Lord. It seems like embedded in that is a verse that we started this Revelation series on the Lamb, where when Jesus came, John pointed and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Even though this isn't about the Lamb in terms of the Lambness, it's still about the Lamb, and we can be absorbing that idea into our hearts as we think about these stories. Gabriel went on to tell Zechariah that his son would go before the Lord in this power, spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people for the Lord. And as a sign of his unbelief, he said, <laughs> I mean, can you imagine yourself in his boat, 70 years old, and you're told you're going to have a son? Well, Abraham was older than that, but I mean, lifespans were, are chronologically different than Abraham. But um, it would have been a hard thing to believe. But as a sign of his unbelief, he was told that he would not be able to speak until the day when his new son's name was chosen. And he confirmed it by the first words he was able to speak. At the other end of the spectrum, we have people like Mary, who are young. We had the children's story uh, here. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, you've got a good role model to uh, reflect, not only reflect on, but to reflect yourself. But the great, uh, the um, youthfulness of Mary, she may have thought to herself, just like Elizabeth and Zachariah, that she was too young, they were too old to have anything significant happen in their life. We don't know how old she was. I've heard guesses as early as 13. That's hard to conceptualize for me. But very probably she was in her teens somewhere along the line. But similar words were used to describe Jesus as were used to describe John. And that is that each of them would be great. But with respect to Jesus, Gabriel went on to say, he would be called the Son of the Most High and would be given the throne of David and he would reign forever. At that point, she found out about her relative. I think it was her cousin that she was pregnant. I, I wonder how she, you know, that must have blown her away to think of, of her cousin. And I can identify with her. My cousins aren't the same age as I am. They're all old enough to be my parents, like they were my aunts and uncles. So when you have big families, you have big uh, age differences between the oldest and the youngest child. Another event worth treasuring for posterity was the first of three times when an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream encouraging Mary to take his wife. And I'd like to read that verse. It's Matthew um, chapter 1, verse 18 through verse 25. This is probably a sermon that's not very timely with respect to seasons of the year, but that's okay. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and following. And this is the New King James Version. It says... Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she, found, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make, any public, make her a public example, 
was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all of this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and took to him his wife, and, they, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. The next thing that must have been recorded in Mary's cherished memories was her trip to see Elizabeth when Elizabeth's baby leaped in her womb and the spirit filled Elizabeth and she exclaimed to Mary, blessed are you and the child you will bear. This statement should indicate why John the Baptist was so humble. Elizabeth didn't brag about her, how blessed she was. She, she expressed how blessed Mary was. Although Mary returned to Nazareth before Elizabeth gave birth, she no doubt heard of the events that took place after she left. When John was pre presented for circumcision and naming, Zechariah wrote that his name was John, just as he was instructed it would be. Then he regained his speech and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit prophesied about his son and the one he should herald. Was there ever a child whose uncle was moved by the Holy Spirit to prophesy his future? Certainly they would have been words to remember. Well, the next big event for Joseph and Mary was their trip that forced them to travel from Galilee to Bethlehem during the last month of her pregnancy. I think the ladies here who have had children can much more identify with this. Uh, I've never ridden on a burrow, but I think it's kind of bumpy. And I've never been nine months pregnant or eight months pregnant. Uh, so I don't know how that feels, nor do I know how it feels to be on a burrow eight months pregnant and going through this bumpy experience. It must not have been very comfortable. But uh, when John was uh, presented for circumcision and naming, I'm sorry, um, although it doesn't say, I wonder if Mary and Joseph connected the dots and realized where they were going and what the Old Testament had already said about the birthplace of the Messiah. Maybe they already knew that. Or maybe they got there and when she had the birth and she may have struck her head, oh, another, you know, memento for, to be remembered that this is the fulfillment of the prophet's message, that Jesus, or that the Messiah would be born in this place. And so whenever it, was, whenever it dawned on her, I'm sure it was, it was with a great sense of awe and assurance about their miraculous son. And isn't it interesting that two miraculous sons were born within, what, uh, th six months of each other? Would that be right? Uh, just one, one, you know, if you want to emphasize something in a document, you make all capital letters and make it in bold and make it bigger than all the other letters. It seems like these stories are that, of that nature. Every story is capital letters and maybe even taller than Cap, uh, all caps. Well, it was shortly after the birth that the next event captured their hearts when the shepherds burst in on them with their story of the angel's appearance and singing on the plains and the angel's instruction about where to find the child and how they would know it was the right one. Well, Mary and Joseph, if you think about them, here they were, I don't know how many miles from Nazareth it was, but they could have felt rather lonely, you know, they didn't have any neighbors that they knew. Um, but here, God sent the shepherds with a fantastic story 
underscoring the significance of their experience. Well, the next treasured memory uh, would be added when they presented Jesus for dedication at the temple. And Simeon appeared out of nowhere and took Jesus in his arms and spoke of their baby as a revelation to the Gentiles and the, and the glory of their people Israel. Later, Simeon must have shared with Mary that it had been revealed that he would not die before he saw with his own eyes the Messiah and how that very day the Holy Spirit led him to the temple at the very hour. So we have a crisscrossing of events. This person coming, this couple coming with their baby. They connected in the temple and um, he revealed to Mary, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. You know, I think it's comforting to realize that God doesn't leave us in the dark all the time about what's going on. There are occasions when it's important to reveal something, give some hint of something that we need to be prepared for the future. We don't want to be blindsided by these events, and God doesn't want us to be blindsided either. He wants us to be faithful. And so the Lord provided some significant people in their lives. Only moments later was confirmed another, uh, another event confirmed um, the journey that Joseph and Mary were having with Jesus. Anna came. She had been praying that she would be permitted to see the Messiah. There were so many intersecting experiences that identified Jesus as the Messiah and what an impact this information must have had not only on Jesus' parents, but upon Jesus himself. Can you imagine the stories that Mary and Joseph must have told Jesus as he grew up? His mind must have been saturated with the supernatural and realizing what a special connection he had with his father. Sometime later, wise men appeared, creating more treasured stories for Mary to share with Jesus when he grew up. Their gifts must have been deeply appreciated, since maybe at that time they did not know that they would not be going immediately back to their home in Nazareth. An angel warned Joseph that he was to go off to Egypt. It almost seems like the gold, the myrrh, and the frankincense was a deposit in their checking account so that they would have enough resources to last however long it was that they would be in Egypt before it was safe for them to go back. As we reflect on how God has led us and what he has taught us through our life, what is it that we treasure? How are we profiting from what he has taught us even though we may not fully understand the circumstances we may be going through at the time. While obedience is really important, focusing on it is not going to fuel our motivation as much as focusing on God's love for us. This is illustrated in a story captured in Arthur White's biography of his grandmother, who was only 15 or 16 at the time when this particular story happened. Her mother was about 56 years old, and I don't know how old her sister was, but together they went to a, a meeting, a religious meeting, where they heard a preacher. And um, the mother shared what she discovered. Ellen wrote, I listened to these new ideas with intense and painful interest. When alone with my mother, I inquired if she really believed that the soul was not immortal. Her reply was she feared that we had been in error on that subject as well as upon some others. But mother, said I, do you really believe that the soul sleeps in the grave until the resurrection? Do you think that the Christian, when he dies, does not go immediately to heaven nor the sinner to hell? She answered, the Bible gives no proof that there is an eternally burning hell. If there is such a place, it should be mentioned, 
in the sacred book. Why, mother, cried I in astonishment, this is strange talk for you. If you believe this strange theory, do not let anyone know about it, for I fear that sinners would gather security from this belief and never desire to seek the Lord. Her mother replied, if this is sound Bible truth, instead of preventing the salvation of sinners, it will be the means of winning them to Christ. And here's the statement. If the love of God will not induce the rebel to yield, the terrors of eternal fire and torment will not drive him or her to repentance. When we think of the cross, we need to follow Mary's example and treasure the insights into his love as revealed in the cross. I grew up in the 50s and 60s. Maybe you weren't even born then, or maybe you were already married and had a family. Um, but I, de I developed or acquired a taste for the King's Heralds. Of course, they've been in existence since the 1930s, I think. But uh, the group that were singing when I was a teenager, not a teenager, but when I was that young, included Jim McClintock, um, Jack Vesey, um, the tenor was, help me out, it was one after Bob Edwards, pardon me, John Thurber, no, uh, well, my memory fails me, but, um, you know, these guys, I learned to appreciate the songs that they sung, and one of the songs that they sang and it has stuck with me and it illustrates the point I would like to make is When I Think of the Cross by Ralph Carmichael and we're going to listen to this quartet sing so enjoy. John Ramsey, I think, was a tenor. Does that ring a bell? Long, long ago in a faraway place The rugged timbers were raised to the sky There hung a man suspended in space and though he was blameless, they left him to die. Just to think of the cross moves me now. The nails in his hands, his bleeding brow. To think of the cross moves me now. It should have been me. It should have been me. Instead, I am free. I am free. I am free. I am free. He put an end to my guilt and despair, turned bitter hating to sweet peace and love. Even the and life from above just to think of the cross moves me now the nails in his hands his bleeding brow to think of the cross moves me now it should have been me it should have been me instead I am free I am John Stott, who I've mentioned several times before, I'm sure, wrote of the significance of what transpired at the cross. He wrote, For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. 
Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrificed himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. In his book, Everybody's Normal Till You Get to Know, know Him or Them, John Ortberg tells a story about a boy named John Gilbert. At age five, John was diagnosed with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, a genetic progressive debilitating disease. At only 25, he lost his battle, but claimed his life. Every year, John lost something. One year, he lost the ability to run, so he couldn't play sports with the other kids. Another year, he could no longer walk straight, so all he could do was watch others play. He lost the ability to do all outward things we think of that make us human. Eventually, he even lost the ability to speak. John Gilbert suffered far more than what most of us can imagine during those years. Groups of students humiliated him because of his condition and because he had to bring a trained dog to school to help him. A bully used to torture him because of his condition and because he had to bring a, pardon me, he had to, uh, there was no supervising teachers there in the lunchroom. No one stood up for him. Maybe they were afraid for themselves. Who knows? And John comments, what a silly species we are. We all need to feel accepted ourselves, but we constantly reject others. John, but John Gilbert had other moments in his life too. Once he was invited to a National Football League fundraising event, when it began, there was one particular item that caught his eye. It was a basketball signed by all the members of the Sacramento Kings. So when the bidding started, he raised his hand, and his mother had to bring it down because they didn't have enough money to even start the bid, let alone finish it. Well, they watched the bidding go up. It rose to an astounding amount compared to the value of the ball, especially compared to other items at the auction. Finally, a man made a bid that nobody else could meet or match. The man walked to the front, claimed a basketball, but instead of going back to his seat, the man walked across the room and gently placed it into the thin, small hands of the boy who desired it so strongly. The man that put the ball into the hands that would never dribble a ball down court, never throw it to a teammate, never shoot it from the foul line, but those hands would cherish it for as long as they lived. John Ortberg writes, it took me a moment to realize what the man had done. I remember hearing gasps all around the room, then thunderous applause and weeping eyes. To this day, he says, I'm amazed. Have you ever been given a gift that you could have never gotten yourself? Has anyone ever sacrificed a huge amount for you without getting anything in return except the joy of giving? We need to cherish far more than we do the depth of God's unconditional, extravagant, lavish love that has paid the price beyond what this man did for John and Gilbert. The destruction of the wicked, the benefits of obedience, are not enough to fuel our relationship with Jesus, only an appreciation of the cross. Will motivate us to a life of obedience. Only the affirmation of his love will empower us to overcome and live for him. Only a consciousness of his unfathomable love will release us from shame, guilt, and the power of temptation. It's his love for us that gives us power to witness. It's his love for us that motivates us to use our talents in serving others. It's his love for us that inspires us to invest our time in other people. It's our love. It's his love for us that moves us to give of our treasure. Should we not focus far more than we do on the costliness of this love? Shall we not treasure more and more how he reached out to those who are so much like us 
Shall we not lift up our hearts in gratitude for those things we know are the work of his providence and care for us?